Welcome to Political Science Podcast. Welcome to Political Science Podcast. Today's guest is Jonathan Havercroft, who is an associate professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Southampton, United Kingdom. His area of expertise are political theory and international relations. He's an author of book Captives of Sovereignty, which was published in 2011. He also co-edited the book The Politics of HBO's The Wire. And he just finished a book on Stanley Cavell's political philosophy of democratic perfectionism. However, the topic we will be discussing today is violent protest and just riot theory. This is a subject of Havercroft's research project that started with an article, Why is there no just riot theory, which was published in 2021. And it won the Brian Berry Prize in political science from the British Academy. And it's also the subject of the book that he's working on. So the main topic of today's conversation is going to be the book on just riot theory that Havercroft is working on. So Jonathan, welcome to the Political Science Podcast. Oh, thank you for having me, Anis. Right. So I'll start with an obvious question. Introductory question is about your forthcoming book, The Topic of Riots. Uh, it has all, often been neglected by the political theorists. Uh, and that's something that you point out in your in your previous work on this topic and also in the forthcoming book. So I was wondering, what drew you to this topic? And why do we need a just riot theory? Yeah, I guess what drew me to the topic actually was when I was a teenager, I was at a rock concert. So it was a Guns N' Roses Metallica concert in 1992 in Montreal. And it was kind of a disaster of a concert. So first Metallica played, and uh, the pyrotechnics went off too early. And James Hetfield got the, the player, one of the players in the band, he got burned. So they stopped playing three songs in, and then people waited around a couple hours. Guns N' Roses came out. They did about three songs, and for whatever reason, Axl Rose was being Axl Rose that day, and he mm -hmm. kind of stormed off the stage. <laughs> And so basically there had been six songs, I think, across two things. And uh, the crowd had been sitting around drinking a lot of alcohol for many hours. And very quickly the crowd started beginning to protest. And then people like, get out of the, sta get out of the stadium. And the lights were kind of being thrown on and off. Mm -hmm. And then some stuff started being burned. And then very quickly it just devolved into a full-on riot. <laughs> and yep. I was like, I was not participating in the riot, but it was actually a fairly scary experience because you're trapped in a stadium with 50, 60,000 people uh, and a lot of people kind of out of control. But the, that experience, I think, stayed with me. And then, like in terms of the research topic, the way I got to that was I was preparing my notes for, I teach a class in the kind of international political theory. Mm -hmm. And we do a lot of stuff on the just war theory tradition in that class. And I was preparing my notes for a just war theory lecture one morning, and it was the morning after there had been the uprising in Baltimore, uh, after the, the death of, or the murder of Freddie Gray by the Baltimore police. Mm -hmm. And I was just struck by the fact that, you know, that we, you know, have a lot of political theory going back to, like, back to ancient Greece, or at least, to, at least to ancient Rome, talking about possible justifications for war. Mm -hmm. And uh, not really much political theory that looks at possible justifications for rioting. And so my, my immediate impulse was the riot that I was in was clearly unjustified, but there might be basis or justification for the kinds of uprisings we've seen in response to police violence in the U.S. and around mm -hmm. the world. So, you know, what kind of theoretical resources exist to help us parse out the differences between those kinds of events? Great. So, in the mainstream liberal literature on civil disobedience in sort of past half a century, riots have often been dismissed as an illegitimate form of protest. They're often perceived as undemocratic, uh, apolitical, I mean, that would be an example of the, the riot from mm -hmm. trial that you mentioned, uh, spontaneous, irrational, and very problematically violent. And therefore, they are unjustifiable. However, you have a bit of a different view regarding the justifiability of riots. So, can you elaborate the main position that you are defending in your previous work that I mentioned, the articles, and now the book that's that's coming out? So, I mean, there's there's a couple of parts to the project. So, the first one is that it, it quickly became obvious to me that it's not obvious what a riot is. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you kind of list, I think, what we'd call like the stereotypical image of a riot. Uh, 
But I think a lot of my research has looked at the, the legal history in the UK and the US on rioting. And really, to my mind, I've basically set on what I call a performative theory of the riot, which by which I mean that um, what makes a riot a riot, at least in the common law tradition, is um, that police officers or kind of state authorities on the scene have to declare that a riot's taken place. Mm -hmm. And so it's that act of declaring a riot and then issuing what's called a dispersal order that turns a mass gathering into an illegal mass gathering. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it a riot. And so when we flip that around, the way that does that flips it around is not necessarily the actions of the people involved in the gathering that triggers the riot, but a decision by the state to declare a particular assembly unlawful. Then we see that really what rioting's about is it's a mechanism for the state to, to engage in crowd control. And that can be for good reasons or for bad reasons, but it's, it certainly is like a state action as opposed to a individual action. And so from, if, you, if you adopt that perspective, then really what rioting is about as a political phenomenon is it's a, is a contestation between what's legal forms of protest or assembly and what are illegal forms of protest or assembly. Because not every crowd action's obviously political, as you say. It could yep. be associated with rock concerts or sporting events or all kinds of things, but it's really a mechanism for the state to control the crowd. And so then given that, then, then that begins to have, let us, leads us to ask a set of questions about, you know, how, how should we balance the rights of public protest and public assembly against um, the need to, you know, protect people from unruly crowds, right? And that, that's, mm -hmm. that's then kind of how I kind of envision the project. Okay. So now I want to get to the, the the core argument of the of the book or your project, yeah. right? And that's when is a riot justified? And I guess the question has has two parts. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the recent article that you worked on called "The Justice in Rioting," you rely on the distinction that exists in already mentioned just war mm -hmm. theory, right? Yeah, and it's, it's a familiar distinction between use ad bellum and use in bello. So the difference between the ends and the means of certain mm -hmm. political, actually violent act in this case, yeah. and well, actually in both case. case cases in case of war and in case of case of riots, right? So in one case we ask, is the incentive or, or the action itself, did it have a, a justifiable cause? Mm -hmm. And then the other um, end we ask, uh, the actions that were done during that uh, mm -hmm. activity, are they justifiable or not? So we can of course imagine uh, war that can be justified as a just war, so it's a defensive war, but maybe the actions committed in that j defensive war, let's say, on Allies' side in Second World War, mm -hmm. there were some atrocities committed which wouldn't be yeah. justifiable, right? Yeah. So you use this analogy, right? And you also talk about well, so the just riot in, in these two ways, right? One mm -hmm. is what would make a riot justifiable as a way of reacting to certain injustices or, or oppressions coming from the, from the uh, state. Mm -hmm. And the other hand, what would be justifiable as an action within the, within the yeah. rioting itself. Yeah. So I was wondering what are some of the elements, what would make the riot justified in those two uh, realms? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So. Let's begin with like the justice, whether or not a riot's justified or justifiable. Or I, I, I know, so I sometimes find myself sliding away from the language of justification mm -hmm. to other terms. So either excusable, perhaps vindicated, and and part there's a like a slightly different reason for that, which draws on some of Cavell's, which I've, I've written a book on Cavell, but yeah. he's got this idea of what we, he calls moral defenses. So we don't always respond to accusations of bad behavior or unjust behavior by saying, oh, that action was justified. Maybe we offer an excuse or, you know, I say maybe we thought it was wrong at the time, but afterwards I was vindicated by my actions because it all worked out. So I, I think it's not necessarily strictly justified. So I want to kind of push back against kind of pinning it down just to that. But on that question, the way I've approached it in the previous article, why is there no just riot theory is to say, okay, the reason there isn't, the reason political theorists struggle with thinking about the riot as a political phenomenon is that a riot is what I call extra-institutional. Okay. So it, it operates outside of institutions. And I kind of identify four kinds of institutions it operates outside of. So it breaks the law. It only breaks the law against rioting, but other kinds of laws. Mm -hmm. It breaks the state's monopoly on violence, so it kind of bre breaches one of the fundamental things the state does by essentially saying this crowd can <laughs> dis disobey and disobey the, the, the monopoly on violence, usually exercised to the police. 
it's um, it's a, it's basically extra parliamentary. By which I mean, normally a politically motivated riot is operating outside of the normal channels through which we try to you know raise our grievances and get the state to change its policies. And then also, kind of quite puzzlingly, the crowds. This weird thing that I call extra public. So we we have you know you can think of Habermas, these yeah, other classic right. political theorists that talk about these this thing called the public, and it's you know people sitting in coffee shops debating, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, what's I think kind of scary about a riot is it's just this spontaneously formed crowd that acts and erupts and does its thing, and then very quickly dissipates, right? And so. Those four things all kind of push against our ability to really make sense of what these events are. But then the point of the article is that actually if you look at political theory, there's lots of different literatures in each of those things that look at different cases where it's justified to leave those institutions, to operate outside them, to resist them if they're behaving unjustly. And then mm -hmm. I kind of draw on those literatures to argue that you know, there's 11 kinds of questions I think we should ask. I call them the 11 criteria. And it's not a tick box exercise. So it's not like, okay, yeah. <laughs> did the riot do this, this, and this? Yeah. But Before you start rioting, yeah, yeah, tick these, tick boxes, these off. Yeah. It's more like, here are a set of questions that we should ask about these events and then use those as a way to reflect about how we respond. So the point of the exercise isn't to... Uh, it's, quite, it's actually in some ways quite different from just war theory where the tradition thing is like, okay, the authorities should think about these things before they launch a war. Or this is actually, like, okay, like how do we respond to this action after the fact? Because most riots happen, are not pre-planned, right? Mm -hmm. they, they happen in response to a moment or a crisis and as a case of a crowd often kind of expressing rage and getting out of control. But perhaps after the fact, some might be more excusable or justifiable than others and that might recall for a different response from the state than those that are inexcusable. Yeah. So uh, in your forthcoming book, you're not dodging the hard questions, right? And one aspect that I want to touch upon is that you're discussing probably the three most controversial aspects of rioting, mm. right? So one of them is uh, destruction of property, either public or, or private destruction of property. One of them is looting. And one is what you call interpersonal violence, which would be violence directed towards uh, not inanimate objects, but that are human yeah. beings, right? Yes. And those, when we talk about rioting, right, understandably, those are the things that especially the critics or, or those who didn't them rioting uh, right off the bat are always pointing out as something that cannot be justified, right? But in your view, there is a more nuanced way we can look at these three controversial aspects of, mm -hmm. of, of rioting, right? And so do you consider these three aspects to be beyond the pale or there are actually instances where they could be justified? So I, that's, a, that's a good question too. So I, I, I agree with you. I think the reason, both again, in political theory. So if you look at political theory from the 70s onward, uh, like Rawls, Arendt, mm -hmm. Walls are kind of the big canonical thinkers of 20th century Western political thought. All do a very careful job to put the riot as a thing that's beyond the pale and in order to carve out a space to defend civil disobedience as something that might be legitimate. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I, part of my thing is kind of a revisionist thing. I think there's others doing good work in this space. So Avia Pasternak's done a very good article and has a book on this topic too. Mm -hmm. Juliet Hooker, or Steve Darcy. There's other people that I think are doing, making a similar move. But what we see ourselves as doing, I think, is kind of questioning some of the assumptions. So the first one's, the, I think the first reason why riots are kind of dismissed as illegitimate or beyond the pale is because mm -hmm. they're seen as violent, right? Yep. But, but the violence is just like, I've just noticed it often since the well, it's a violent riot, right? And I'm like, well, what's the violence that it entails? So one of the things I've done is spend a fair bit of time looking at major uprisings in the last 20, 30 years. And my focus is honestly Canada, the UK, US, just because I know those countries the most. Yeah. but. Um, there's like several, you can find examples everywhere because the riots are a fairly common phenomenon. And in, if I look at those, I've, I've gone and done things like pull what are called police after, after action reports or often after a major event, there'll be these commissions set up to mm -hmm. investigate what happened. And those are actually quite useful documents because one of the things they'll document is you know, all the kinds of individual crimes that happened, how many people were arrested. And so I'm like, okay, what's actually violent in a riot? And so I just look at the charging information. And the most common thing, and it's a pattern kind of across these episodes, is actually looting is the okay. most common action. 
The second most common then is vandalism, what we call vandalism, or just property destruction. Property destruction, yeah. right? And then the third would be um, is interpersonal violence, but that's actually fairly low, mm -hmm. and it normally involves kind of physical altercations with the police. So it's often cl clashes between police and protesters, where the protesters somehow push back or they throw mm -hmm. things at the police, etc. There are, of course, in these things also other incidents that happen because it's a breakdown in public order, and so there's always opportunists in the crowd that may try to do things, settle scores, there may be fights between people. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that there's like no other stuff, but it's a fairly consistent pattern that the primary kind of activity that happens is looting, then property destruction, then interpersonal violence. Okay, so given that, I think there's a couple of things to note. First, in almost all cases, the violence is what we would call non, what I would classify as non-lethal violence, by which I mean it's a, it may be an act of direct physical application of force to another person or another object. So you definitely are like mm -hmm. trying to hit or break or ha cause harm to something, but the intention is very rarely to try to kill someone. And I think that actually intentional lethal violence is murder. And I think there's almost no case in which we even even if that episode was contesting an act of police violence, I think there's almost no case in which I can think of where an act of lethal inten intentional lethal violence could be justified. So I'm not defending that kind of violence, okay. although I'm not denying that certainly within these episodes, there could be episodes like that that happen. But I think we can agree that those actions aren't. And then the question is, okay, what kinds of things might be permissible in property destruction versus what I would call as like wanton, right? So just kind of going around and recklessly smashing stuff, that's probably not permissible. But actually, if you look at a lot of politically motivated riots, mm -hmm. often the targets for property destruction are quite clearly the thing being protested, right? So like a, a, a classic is like Minneapolis uprising 2020 in response to George Floyd murder. One of the first, one of the first significant episodes in those kind of several nights of, of uprising was um, a crowd went and they began demonstrating and protesting outside the police station, the police precinct. Mm -hmm. To this day, it's, it's debated, like it depends on who you talk to, but essentially the police station eventually burns down as a result of the crowd action. It's not really clear okay. exactly who caused it. It's like, you, you can get very different narratives out of Minneapolis on that. But, you know, it's kind of understandable, I'd say, <laughs> that a crowd would outraged over yeah, not yeah. just Derek Chauvin killing George Floyd, but actually this was like the 11th episode in the Twin Cities in recent years of police killing black citizens, unarmed black citizens, and essentially no action in any of that, that the rage of the crowd is then redirected towards a symbol, mm -hmm. which they see their rage, and perhaps that's, you know, a more understandable kind of violence, yeah. right? Another example I look at is the Colston statue toppling. We had a lot of other mm -hmm. episodes like this in the wake of the 2020 uprising, where crowds would go and target monuments and symbols associated with kind of histories of structural racism or his institutionalized racism. So in the U.S., targeting Confederate signs, symbols of the Confederacy. In the U.K., a lot of uh, kind of targeting of symbols associated with the slave trade. So I think that those are the kinds of property destruction that's quite different from, you know, just teenage kids who go around and like spray paint or yeah. tag something, right? Which is probably less what justifiable. What we usually think about when we talk about vandalism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, when we think about that, those kinds of actions, it's it's kind of reckless or sociologists talk about deviance versus defiance as like one yeah. way of saying what would be this. the distinction? So both involve breaking a norm or breaking a law, but deviance is just, I just do it because I don't care or I'm like, whatever, right? So I'm, I'm not a law abiding citizen. Whereas an act of defiance is one where I'm aware of what the law is that I'm breaking, but I don't recognize, I'm contesting legitimacy no, of that law. I'm breaking that law. As, yeah, I'm consciously kind of, breaking that as a law. political message or kind of a... Yeah, right? Or I'm, I'm consciously breaking it to demonstrate that I think that law is wrong. Oh. Something behind that law or the legal order is wrong, right? And so I think there's a difference in, in terms of those two kinds of actions. And I think it's, you know, we, we, we start looking at particular cases, I think it's actually a lot easier than people assume to draw, draw distinctions there. So the sub question to, to poke you a bit more on this, right? So concretely, you said looting is, the, is one of the most widespread when you look at these reports, one of the yeah. most widespread. Things. Yeah. So in, in your view, is there, because uh, usually, when, especially when I think about uh, the protests that turn violent concerning mm. the Black, Life, Black Lives Matter movement, right? Usually the condemnation, I think even the then President Obama kind of condemned it on those grounds, is that, 
Well, if it involves looting, right, then there is mm. the political message is mud, mudded and, and it basically turned from reaction, maybe justifiable reaction of, of kind of political frustration mm -hmm. and reaction to deep injustices or structural injustices. And it turns into sort of self-interested, uh, egoistical game of, well, grabbing a TV or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So usually looting, the, mi the minute the looting shows up, it says, okay, that kind of discredited the whole, yeah. the whole thing. So I was wondering, what's your view on that? I is there, if there is looting involved in, in the riot, does that dec discredit the whole, whole event uh, and it makes it unjustifiable? Or are there situations where actually looting might be if we don't want to use the mm. word justifiable, then it could be vindicated, right? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Okay, so step one is I don't want to, the reason I want to draw a distinction between specific actions being justifiable or not mm -hmm. within a riot versus the riot as a whole is because certainly if you're talking about thousands of people gathering a breakdown in order, right, which is a large part of what a riot is, People in that crowd may, may, may have multiple different motivations yep. and yep. actions, right? It's not so, one mind, right? It's not one mind. So one thing is, okay, let's say there's 20,000 people involved in this action, and most of them are actually just protesting something. And, that could st and because the crowd starts getting a bit unruly, the police declare a dispersal order. They, the people that are protesting not doing any action, any action, any of the other actions we've talked about, I don't think really are kind of guilty of anything, right? Apart from the presence of the riot. But um, some people could start just doing random things. So mm -hmm. some people certainly do use these kind of breakdowns in order as a target of opportunity to, to steal stuff, stuff they want, right? So I think we can kind of clearly say that if that's the thing that's going on, then, um, then that's not justifiable, right? But I do think that there is, like, both if we go look historically at rioting and if we look at kind of more recent examples of kind of looting that happened in cases of breakdown of law and order, there is a way in which the crowd is quite self-policing, right? And this is like, if you go back and look at E.P. Oh, Thompson, that's interesting, who, yeah. he writes this article, history article called The Moral Economy of the Crowd back in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And he's looking at grain riots back in the 1700s, early 1800s. And these are actually, like, our image of food riots probably kind of from popular from movies, like a bunch of peasants, you know, yeah, yeah, storming yeah. and raiding something. And he's like, actually, it was extremely orderly that what it really was was the crowd in a local community, let's say it was during a grain shortage or some unscrupulous grain merchant started charging way too much. They would say that price is unfair. And so what they would do is they would actually raise, a, they'd call it raising a riot. They just get the local crowd. Often they would, what they would do is go to the sheriff's house and kind of forcibly abduct the sheriff, say, come with us. And they would divvy up the grain from the grain merchants' silos to the people. Like say, mm -hmm. okay, you get this, you get this, you get this. Everyone gets an equal share. And they would then pay the sheriff what okay. they considered a fair amount, mm -hmm. right? And so I think Thompson's point, he calls it the moral economy of the crowd. His point is that actually a lot of these political actions were really redistributive actions. So technically, that's looting, right? Te it's we're looking across. Yeah, yeah, it's we slightly it transhistorical, yeah. but technically, it's a large crowd seizing a bunch of stuff and then doing that, right? But there's like I think like another kind of high profile recent example. It's, it's not technically during a riot, but I think it gets to the same thing is during Hurricane Katrina um, in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Like that was a complete. The city's basically blocked off for days on end, yeah. and there's lots of accounts of people with with police awareness and assistance, kind of just saying, "Okay, we're going to go to the grocery store, even though the power's off. We'll break the windows because we need food." Yeah, and there's lots of examples of people kind of, and they, and there's accounts of people. You know, there certainly were accounts of people who took like as way more than they wanted or started stealing TVs or something else. Yeah. But a lot of it's also just we need food. Or there's actually a very famous case of a doctor, in, and he was actually charged, and then eventually it became a kind of bit of a legal sensation, but he was a doctor who... This is the, during the Katrina. During the Katrina, Katrina he's at a hotel. In the aftermath. Of the in Katrina. the aftermath, right? Mm -hmm. The city's basically blocked off for seven days. It's, you know, and he's a doctor, and he's at a hotel, and a lot of people find he's a doctor, and he's like, I need medicines to go treat him, to treat yeah. these people. And the police help him go to a pharmacy. They break into the pharmacy. They break into the medical area the, the, where the medicines are, and they take all the medicines. And he's a licensed doctor, so he knows how to distribute them. Mm -hmm. And he distributes them freely, right? And I, I think it's one of those things where, I, I, you know, only a, the strictest of like legal 
moralists would say in that case that's unjustified, right? But there's clearly something in that case where there's a deeper moral code, which is like, the, you know, he isn't going to take people's insurance or ask for their copay yeah, yeah, or charge yeah. the money. He's like, the, the duty of care here supersedes all of that. And we've got these medicines here. And the economic order is suspended. Mm-hmm. We, well, but right? what happened? Was he brought to trial? or He was, was brought up, and or? then eventually they decided not to charge him. Okay. But it's actually cited as... So as what's interesting is there's a Senate report. This is, uh, the way I discovered is there's a Senate report on the aftermath of Katrina. And it was a lot about the breakdown of law and order mm-hmm. and the failures of policing. But initially they know that he was kind of considered as doing something wrong, but the Senate actually commended him as like this act of, you know... Um, they commended him as doing this act of... Uh, you know, tremendous service. And, okay. and and what struck me about that is this is a white doctor, and so he's held up, but the narrative around Katrina is often like, oh, these lawless black people looting yeah, yeah, stuff. Yeah. But actually, if you go look at, like, specific accounts, most most people of color in Katrina, they, like the New Orleans community, were doing the exact same thing. There's like, we need food, right? Like, yeah, it, yeah. If, if your power goes out at home and it's hot, yeah. <laughs> your food's going to f- spoil very quickly. Right, most of us probably don't, if we're being honest, have the supplies for more than a couple of days if there's kind of a breakdown. And so people went and got food when they needed food. Right. So, you know, I think that points to the fact that not every act of looting is just simply this acquisitive. I want, you know, nice shoes or a nice yeah, yeah. TV. There's often other motivations behind it. Right. I mean, we already touched upon now several examples, but just for the listeners, I want to translate sort of maybe these more abstract uh, theoretical ideas to certain concrete examples. And uh, here again in your forthcoming book, you're doing that yourself. So you're doing a comparison of the Black Lives Matters movement, which you already mm-hmm. mentioned, right? Yeah. And some of the rioting or, or possibly the violence that uh, was brought up by that movement. And also a uh, very controversial case of the January 6 Capitol Hill mm-hmm. riot. In your view, using these two examples, can you further explain your theoretical position and how would you evaluate this? There is, is there a, a normative difference looking at these two different types of uh, uh, use of I mean, violence in the public public space? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the biggest question is is basically the question of democracy, right? Mm-hmm. So I would say, I mean, and I argue, I argue, there's actually a blog post online where immediately after January 6th, I wrote this up. I think if you just Google it, you can uh, find it or I can give you the link for the show notes. Um, but basically, you know, my read of January 6th is that it was an anti-democratic riot. It was, a, it was an attempted coup. Okay. And so, you know, over to my, you know, I think I, democracy is a fairly basic norm for most political theorists. And so something as fundamental as that is just clearly, that's beyond the pale. Not because it's insurrection or a riot, but because it's an attempt to subvert a free and fair election by stopping the process by which you certify the duly elected mm-hmm. president as president. So at the level of what we were like comparing back to, you said the bellum, it would yeah. be unacceptable, right? Yeah, they, 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 regardless of what happened during the mm-hmm. event, the yeah, yeah. Regardless of what happens so. during the event, it's just it's kind of completely beyond the pale, right? I think I think the Black Lives Matter uprisings in 2020 or earlier, mm-hmm. those are those are cases of contesting a, a political order, or a police order that kills at, at like very large rates, and I think it's mm-hmm. it kills black men, mostly men, at very large rate, at very large rates in the U.S. at kind of unacceptable rates, and it's contesting this long history of police violence and it's a demand for, that that should change and you know this isn't i mean you can you can go back to accounts to the 60s and before of like kind of communities protesting this kind of violence and actually one of the things i found is that a lot of the more high profile riots in the last 20 30 40 years have, all, have almost always been triggered by cases of police killing civilians often in, in places the community finds completely unacceptable very few cases do those officers get charged. In, I think Chauvin's, Derek Chauvin's the first person to actually be convicted, <laughs> right? Okay. Even before, like, I, you know, these protests also, not just in terms of like protesting that injustice, but I think they've also just had a transformative effect in terms of how we, how people in the U.S. and around the world think about police violence, right? So one of the consequences was the rise of different kinds of uh, projects that like start to track these reports because yeah. one of the consequences the police wouldn't report this as a police killing of a person they'd just be like oh it's an incident or whatever they, yeah, they, yeah. it wouldn't be tracked as a stat let alone a stat at a national level and it turns out that 
you know, the police are killing several thousand people in the U.S. every year, and the, the causes for that are not really known or thought about, right? So there's been a pretty significant shift just in terms of consciousness about this phenomenon, right? And so I think those are some of the positive transformative effects that have come about from this uprising, whereas, say, January 6th, I think it's clearly a case to try to subvert democracy. It was, it was an authoritarian coup attempt, basically. Okay. So just to draw the conclusion or, or from these comparing these two examples, right? So your approach would be first to look at if thing that started a riot mm. or motivated the people involved in the riot mm -hmm. can be seen to be normatively justifiable or mm -hmm. maybe post factum vindicated, right? Yeah. And first, that's the criteria that has to be satisfied. And then yeah. if that's satisfied, then we can look at what happened during the riot and if mm -hmm. some aspects of it are unacceptable or worth of the condemnation or actually we can even justify some of those actions like we already mentioned, the uh, vandalism or looting or even interpersonal personal violence, right? Yeah. So in the case of January the 6th Capitol Hill riot, right, we don't even have to look at what happened because the initial impulse is already anti-democratic and therefore we can't justify the yeah. use of violence in that context. Yeah, so I think if that's the case, then I think everything that follows afterwards is is not possibly defensible, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, okay. you know, um, if in the other case, then other things might be defensible, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, I want to turn to one question that, or, or issue that's been sort of in the media recently. I mean, uh, you started your career in, in Canada, and then in the US and then you moved to, to UK. And now you have worked as a professor at the UK University for a while now, mm -hmm. right? So, and as you said, part of your, the cases you are researching in, in uh, as part of this project uh, involved US and, but also, also UK. So I was wondering what's your take or what's your view on the Public Order Act that was recently passed by the, by the UK government, right? So this act addresses different forms of public protest, not just mm -hmm. riots, Yeah, uh, but it seems to be designed I won't say specifically, but it, it, at least in mind with uh, punishing uh, environmental activists. And we can see more and more, not just in the mm. UK, right, in different countries, also countries of the European Union, movements like Extinction Rebellion, right, who mm -hmm. are breaking the law and not just breaking the law, but sometimes it even escalates into violence, addressing these uh, environmental issues. So back to the Public uh, Order Act. Uh, it's... Some have even described it as sort of draconian, right? Because it even allows police to apprehend or react before the possible protest or, mm. or violent action happens, just on the suspicion that something like that might happen, that would allow them to detain people, right? Yeah. Now, we have a, we have a case of that in Croatia, just to draw a parallel, uh, but that only happens on, on sports events, right? When there are people who have been charged with football hooliganism, mm -hmm. right? And then they would be, on the day of the game, right? They would be kind of detained or, or mm -hmm. like kind of a house arrest and definitely yeah. not allowed to enter the stadium mm -hmm. by, the, by the police, right? But this goes, goes, it seems to me, goes much wider, wider than that in its, in its uh, scope. So I was wondering, what's your opinion about this? And, and the reason I'm asking is that, I mean, you are dealing with this issue as a scholar, right? As a theorist. Yeah. But uh, you also offered your scholarly expertise by submitting evidence to the UK Parliament on the impact of the uh, 2021 Courts, Police, Crime and Sentencing Bill on the rights of public assembly, yeah. right? So you have yeah. some experience of communicating with, mm -hmm. with the government and, yeah. the, well, in this case, yeah. the highest levels of government about uh -huh. this issue. So I was yeah. wondering, what's your take on that? So, okay, so in the UK currently, there's been multiple iterations of this. So the bill that I offered evidence on... Mm -hmm. um, Actually, that the the parts around public assembly were quite controversial. I don't the, the minutiae of kind of UK Parliament is it got, it's called I think they call it ping pong or whatever. I can't remember the exact term, but basically the House of Lords would keep taking those parts out. Um, House of Commons would keep putting it back in. Uh, this later Public Order Act was kind of brought in last year as a mm -hmm. way to kind of keep toughening the the laws around public order. The different pieces of legislation, you're exactly right, they have been written in response to recent protest tactics used by groups, Extinction Rebellion's one, but there's kind of multiple others. Um, and the, the conservatives are kind of framing it as we're just trying to stop disruption, right? Uh, it, the powers they've given are actually quite shocking. I, I 
I'm hard pressed to find in recent years any anything that would pass for kind of like a liberal democracy under say polity or you know one of these <laughs> metrics using yeah. these kinds of using this this kind of very draconian legislation and it's basically the the things that are quite disturbing about it is first of all it gives a lot of preemptive powers mm-hmm. so um, what it does it allows the police to arrest people before a disruptive action has taken place right so be, that's and it's right away it's been abused like during the coronation of King Charles um, Mm-hmm. One of the high-profile cases is there was a group that's called like Republic.uk or something. They're opposed to the monarchy, so they they came out of these vans with these hands saying, "Not my king." The police alleged they were planning disruptive action. They contended they weren't. The evidence is fairly flimsy. The police just swept all of them up before they'd done anything. They just literally got out of the bands of their signs and sent them off to jail and locked them up for the 14 hours of the coronation and then released them and then didn't charge them. Right? Okay. So and they apologized. Said, "I'm sorry." Right? But. You can note that if you're if you're political movements targeting the king, <laughs> you only get one chance to protest the coronation, right? And it, it, any society where the head of state can't be protested is not a democratic society in my mind, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that we're seeing this like erosion of democracy, and I, th- I think the biggest point is that. Public assembly rights are actually really foundational to democracy. Like I can't think of any democracy that didn't have as part of its foundational moment mass crowd protests, right? Mm-hmm. Certainly, like we think about freedom of the press, but that's actually that's actually I mean it's an important right also, but it's it really only suits like people like us, like people who are quite yeah. skilled at writing and communicating, and that really is you know for lack of a better term part of the intellectual and cultural elite. That's their primary mechanism of protest, but. For the average, you know, person, probably mass assembly in opposition to something the government's doing is the most direct and effective way of contesting political power. And if regimes do start using, uh, and I can tell you a story, like there's a longer story besides this, but if regimes, political regimes are kind of increasingly cracking down on public assembly rights, and I really mm-hmm. think there's a lot of evidence for that in the UK and in Canada and in the US over the last few years, and I think I assume in other countries also, we should be concerned about what this means for the health of democracy long term. Okay, great. Well, on that worrying note, <laughs> thank you for being our guest on Political Science uh, Podcast. We're looking forward to the book that's coming out on, on Just Riot Theory, and um, we hope to have you again as our guest. Oh, thank you very much. Slušali ste Politološki podcast u produkciji Hrvatskog politološkog društva. Urednik, glazba i voditelj Enes Kulenović. Pomoć u realizaciji Višeslav Raos, Krešimir Petković i Leon Cvrtila.